with our discussion on leadership. We have stated that um, a leader is a person who has a clarity of vision which he shares with his group and the group trusts him enough to follow that vision. So he therefore will play sometimes management role when he's managing the group, but his, great, his title comes from his ability to help the group to go forward to a certain direction, to a certain vision. We've been looking at various characters in the Bible, <coughs> men and women, who we read about in the Bible, who have, and of course, the assumption is that the reason they were, their names appear in the Bible is because they had a level of influence. We have picked today a, a, a very rare character, mentioned not too many places, Peter's mother-in-law. That very statement in the Bible makes us know that Peter was a family man, because the rest of the scriptures do not talk about his family. But for you to have a mother-in-law, you must of necessity be a son-in-law. And that means you must have a wife. That means you must be uh, somebody who knows something about the family. So by picking the character of Peter's mother-in-law, it will also, also for us to see a bit of the son-in-law and how they were related and what lessons we can learn. In the process, when you talk about leadership, we also talk about family leadership. And there are lessons we can learn in how we lead our families. But of course, every group is a family of some sort. And um, it will be important to understand. One of the thing, first things we learned right at the beginning is that there is a relationship between the son and the mother-in-law that is strong enough for him to want to bring the master to his own home because the mother-in-law is sick. And the relationship is such that the mother-in-law, as soon as she is healed, wants to entertain the son-in-law's visitor, Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of stories go about, about uh, in-laws and uh, mother-in-laws and how difficult they can be. We have at least a chance to see one mother-in-law that is humble enough to want to help in the son's-in-law's problems and a son-in-law that is loving enough to want to see how to sort out the issues of the mother-in-law. So even as we talk about leadership, it, I think the lesson I'm getting out of this is that we need to avoid stereotyping and halo effect. You can stereotype and say, no, oh, you know, she's my mother-in-law. And that stereotype makes you behave towards her in a certain way. And it makes her be, when she says, oh, you know, he's my son-in-law. Again, she starts behaving about you in a certain way. But when you start dealing with real people rather than stereotyping, it's very helpful. Any leader will be the weaker if he is tempted and practices Stereotyping. What is stereotyping? Stereotyping is when you think somebody is of a certain group and then in your own mind you force him to fit in that group. Your expectation is about that group. You know, you know, this guy is a Kikuyu. And whatever you think about Kikuyu, you assume this guy must be like that. That is stereotyping. And obviously, the truth of the matter is. Not all people are the same. So even if you have met 90% and they behave like that, who tells you that this particular guy is not outside, uh, he is an outlier, he is not inside the, inside the group? And so it means that every leader must seek as much as he can to avoid stereotyping. Deal with the people, find about them, about them, get evidence about anything you are claiming about them. Do not assume that it's enough that because you have put them in a certain stereotype, then they are like that. That will be true of followers about their leaders. It's also true of the leader about the followers. Avoid stereotyping.
there's the other word that goes with, with it, which is halo effect. What's halo effect? That you meet somebody in a certain mood the first time you meet. Then you lock him there. Every time you meet him, you assume he is in the same mood. That's halo effect. And a lot of people suffer in interviews that um, on that particular day, the uh, candidate comes in a certain mood. I say, no, 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 he can't be a good worker. Why? Just because of one incident, one view. That's halo effect. We need to understand that people are not stuck in a certain mood that they had at a certain time. It will be important to understand that if they truly are human, they are evolving all the time, they are changing all the time, they also have the ability to think, the ability to appreciate, they also have values that force them to behave in a certain way. And the fact that somebody may have failed in, at one time does not mean that they are going to fail at all times. You know, Peter's mother-in-law is one of the most famous and unnamed women in the Bible. May, you know, he's, he's simply a mere footnote in the annals of biblical history. Yet, God specifically calls attention to her in three of the Gospels as Jesus enters Peter's home and heals her of a fever, which she then immediately rises to serve Jesus. So why, why, would, Jesus, why would, uh, would God want us to hear about the mother in law? And why not tell us more? I think one of the great lessons you can learn out of this is that to be remembered for impact may be more important than your name. We have no idea what the woman was called. She's Peter's mother-in-law. But when you see the details of the one paragraph that she, she has, you realize there's a lesson God wants us to get. And you need to understand the same way. You should not be taken up by by what name you have or a name you don't have, what impact, when you relate with the people, what impact do you make? For example, we have no idea whether she ever met, met Jesus again. We have no idea whether there's, a, there's an encounter with the apostles again. But that one encounter and the way she was able to rise up and help entertain the visitors is recorded in, in, the, in the Bible. So, three things that comes out of that. Number one, please understand it's not the name, it's the impact you make. You may have a pedigree of a name. You may have, you may have big names that you can keep dropping. But what impact are you making on the people that you are relating with? Number one. Number two, I think it will be important to understand then that... Um, that, that the story that is told, since its selection, John tells us that if all Jesus did was to be written, he could not fit in all the books of the earth. Since it is, it is to be selected, it means that her behavior and what happened did not happen every day. So the second thing we must learn then is, don't say I have been working so hard, I can now relax. That moment... Maybe the moment that will make the biggest impact of your life. Don't say, but you know, I've been doing it for 50 years. No, 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 no. If you are not dead yet, there may be still something you do at your deathbed that will make an impact at your last. So our impact is what matters. And that impact can be made in all kinds of situations. Can be made when you are giving a lecture to a to an august uh, organization, or even when you are dealing with your grandchild, the impact can be made in any place. And I think that's one of the things we learn out of this, out of this story, that that um, of the of the mother in, of the mother-in-law. And, uh, and and I pray that uh, you rather ask yourself, that does not mean you do you actually make an impact, and do, and you can make an impact by the way you exercise. You can make an impact by the way you rest. You can make an impact by the way you do your professional work. You can make an impact by the rate 
you relate at home. So we are not suggesting that you are always working, but the way you do things will be something that will be very, very important. When can anyone who has met you say about you in one sentence? It's something else I want us to do. In other words, you summarize somebody's life in one sentence. You know, Matthew 8, 14 to 15 is where, is where the story of um, mother-in-law is. Now, when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and served them. Matthew 8, verses 14 and 15. Two verses. Similarly, if you are to be asked to say on one sentence about your spouse, one sentence about any one of your children, one sentence about your mother, one sentence about your father, one sentence about your boss, one sentence about whoever you have related with, what is it you would say? You don't have, a lot of, you don't have enough space to give stories or explain. You just have to summarize what impact they have made on you? What would it be? Now turn it around. What do you think the people we have just mentioned would say about you? What kind of impact do you make on them? Remember, we have kept emphasizing that leadership is influence. The influence you are, the impact, the influence you are making on them is what really will, will, will matter. And so we are trying to find out what can anyone say in a sentence about you? What difference have you made in their lives? Do you seek to be of service to others? Or it's always self-centered? You're always thinking about yourself. You're always thinking about your entitlement. What they call entitlement mentality. The people should be serving you. But what if you turn around to think that God created you so that you can be of service to, him, to mankind, to the people he brings you away, and seek in every one of them a way of making an impact on them by serving them, by making life easier for them, by making their time more enjoyable, by helping them to realize their vision and mission. If that's what you are doing, then obviously to increase your influence and you'll be able to help people that are following you to realize their full potential. You know, we have to admit that not much is known about this uh, woman. Um, but we, of course we know enough that she served Jesus and um, also the disciples that were in the, in the house. We are not told exactly where her daughter, the wife of Peter, was. But he had told specifically the old lady is the one who was serving. So why does God focus on her? No, not, and without telling us her name, but as a person who was critical in Pete, Apostle Peter's life. Um, and obviously also important in Jesus' ministry. Why does God purposely include her short, brief story in the Bible, and how does this extend to Jesus' capacity of love for everyone, regardless of name or stature? I think several things come out of that. Um, that, 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 that the first thing we need to understand, and Jesus wants us to know, is that he loves everyone. He doesn't just love Peter and his wife. He can be touched by whatever touches Peter. And mother-in-law was somebody Peter was concerned about, and so Jesus is interested in them. Do you get that in that sense, that the people you relate with, if you are a Christian, they will get God's blessings via you. They will get to know about God via you, because God is interested in the people you relate with, just like he was interested 
in Peter, Peter's um, relations. And I think that's one of the things you need to understand. So we have this story, I think, in order to remind us that Jesus is interested in our relatives. <coughs> He's interested in our people. You know, elsewhere in the book of Acts, we hear of this, the jailer being told, you will be saved and your household. In other words, when you yourself surrender to Jesus, Jesus is interested in the people that are related with you. But I think number two, the other thing we learn about it is to see how a family situation looks like. You know, most of the Gospels are not written about families. So here we have a chance to see a family where the daughter, the son-in-law, and the, and the mother-in-law are together. Whether she was visiting or she was staying, we have no idea. But I think it's important to understand that the fact that you are busy serving the Lord does not excuse you from being somebody who is useful in your own home, in your own clan, among your relatives, in your neighborhood. Jesus comes home, in this particular home, to be a blessing to them. And to demonstrate to us that Peter had an influence and an interest in his own home. But thirdly, I think we, we are seeing this home, home situation so that we understand, like I mentioned earlier, that uh, we should not stereotype and think that everybody doesn't do well with their mother-in-law. Here, Peter seems to have been quite at home with the mother-in-law. And I think those things are coming out. So we are trying to answer the question, why tell us the story? I think we want, we want it known, or God wants us to know, that if you, you start by impacting your own family, it will be like the pilot project. It will be like the practice area for you to become impactful out there. Peter was useful in his own family. No wonder he, as an apostle, he became somebody impacting nations. And I think that will be something that will be important for us to, for us to tell and to know. The great apostle Peter, as mentioned briefly in in some in one of the writings of around that time, Joseph's Antiquities of the Jews, we we learn not in the Bible but from these writings, he was originally a freed man, or of Banis. You know who was married to King Herod before he became Jesus' disciple when he was caught in the banks of Sea of Galilee. A freed man during biblical times was different from a freed slave. They were considered privileged Roman workers. Even if they were Jewish, who enjoyed certain privileges only reserved for Roman citizens. Therefore, Peter must have been one of those people with privileges. Peter, being a freedman, was able to marry whom he pleased and could work for wages as an employee, not a slave. A third, Simon Peter and his older brother, Andrew, freed, freely moved within the courtyard of Herod <coughs> the Great and worked as a laborer under Bernice before becoming a Jewish fisherman, and more importantly, a fisher of men at a later stage. So, this, this story from Josephus is, um, is uh, quite an interesting story because it gives us a side of Peter that's not emphasized, his ancestry. Two things we learn. Your ancestry, once you start getting involved in what God has called you, will not matter. But it must have given him certain privileges. And um, so if he has married from royalty, he, we are suggest Josephus is suggesting he also, he also had royalty. And because of that, he, really, he was able to move around. When other disciples are running away, when Jesus is arrested, him he is able to go right up to the courtyard because that was something he could do. 
when he is actually denying Jesus, he is already in the in the in the courtyard. What are we learning? He had certain privileges the other the other apostles may not have had, but he used those privileges for the means of ministry. He wants to dis to know what is happening to the master. He wants to he is concerned about what is happening to Jesus. So he used he uses his privileged position, assuming this is true, he uses his privileged position in order to go right up to through the the, 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 the process when Jesus is being is being um, um, taken through some kind of a kangaroo court. Um, and uh, G Peter is there. He can't do much, but he sees more than the other apostles are able to see. Let me ask you a question. Your privileges, what good are they doing to the kingdom? The fact that you are very educated, what difference is it making to God's kingdom? The fact that you are a man of wealth, what difference is it making for the kingdom? The fact that you can drop names, you have connections, what difference is it making for the ministry, for God's work? I think that's something that you need to ask yourself. You know, Peter, who was actually a Jew, um, could roam about in Herod's courtyard, which is a privilege. You know, the legendary tradition holds that Peter married this, this lady, who was Alexander's daughter, who was Aristobras, a named niece and King Herod's granddaughter, having been brought to Herod's court to live with her two brothers, with her two brothers, where when her father was assassinated by Herod. There, Herod the Great's granddaughter met and married Peter. No marriage to royalty should not make you less surrender to God. You know, he is daring enough to do things that will that Herod may not be happy with, at least given the kind of stories we hear about Herod, but he still is able to serve the Lord. Does your ancestry, does your privilege discourage you from serving God, or does it help you to serve the Lord? Do you feel that is beneath me? I can't preach in such a place, or oh, surely I can preach, but only to organize groups. Or do you feel like you can use it for good? Peter doesn't seem to have been bothered by his connections. You know, I don't know whether she, the, this, this mother in law was called Graphis, who was a late um, Alexander's Jewish wife, and, there, and then became the mother in law of, of Peter in the Bible. If we go by the stories about her, she seems to have had a terrible reputation since she was considered an infamous star of trouble in Herod's great court. And of course, you know that Herod has a very dysfunctional family himself. Some people even claim that she was responsible for her own husband and her brother-in-law, Aristobulus' death, since she constantly gossiped and complained and warned with her sister-in-law, Bernice. Assuming that story is true, she maybe even have had affairs, married several times after her husband died. Yet, in between this latter relationship, Graphis, well, this lady, mother-in-law of Peter, lives with her daughter-in-law, Peter's wife, during a time when Jesus visits. So, this lady who is turn out, turning out so good may not necessarily have had a very good uh, story behind her. And so, it means that of necessity, the, Jesus makes an impact that transforms her to the kind of woman we now meet in the passage that is written. And that's what Jesus does. That even the very worst person, when you introduce them to Jesus, could change to somebody who will wake up, be healed, and start serving, serving the Lord, which is uh, 
which would be quite an, an important thing. You know, Peter is expected of a responsible Jewish man to great care of both his wife and her mother. This story of her sickness and healing should show us that. You know, he, he must have loved his wife as he loved his mother. And um, maybe, just maybe, that he's volatile, very vol volatile kind of uh, temperament was well managed by a patient, reasonable, comforting, sympathetic wife. Modest woman, maybe, of appearance. Otherwise, why is Peter talking about the weaker vessel? In, when he writes in First Peter chapter 1 or First Peter chapter 3, do not let your adornment be merry outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. You know, the good you want to do in society must start with your spouse. And um, that, that, that small phrase is helping us to see Peter dealing with the, with the, dealing with the, with the spouse. So God gives you a spouse to impact you, but you also, she also, she also, you also are supposed to be impacting her. You should be concerned about them, and that means the team, the evangelistic team going places, stops going in order to come to deal with a problem that you actually have. And that's something all of us as leaders need to know, that they are, we must give our family priority. And I think that will be something that's very important. You know, maybe the other thing we learn out of this story is uh, Peter's life consumed or by by serving the Lord was not defined just by the fact that he is with the, with the Lord. He was able to navigate where he is serving the Lord and is available for his wife. I think these days they are calling it work and life balance. And I think that's what one of the things that this story will help you to have. What's even more striking is that Jesus does not does the goes to this home without reservation. Obviously, Jesus knows this woman is related to King Herod, the great, the man who ordered the murder of innocent babies when Jesus was born, but doesn't seem to bother him. He helps. Are you like that? Do you help even people you suspect were connected with your troubles in the past? Loving enemies includes not using the association to condemn him. In other words, this is not Herod. Maybe a relative of Herod. It's not Herod. They need healing. You give healing to whoever actually needs it. You know, a, play, a person's place of birth, citizenly, relatives, or employment, or any lack thereof, does not make, nor take away from the identity when Jesus is concerned. He will help anyone, anyone who needs his help, irrespective or whether he's connect, connected with you. But it also tells you the fact that nobody keeps, talks to us about this connection. It tells you name dropping is a sign of insecurity and will affect your influence. Why can't you yourself have values that you live by, a life you live with, that will make people follow you? Or do you want them to follow you because you are connected with certain other people? You know, you are closer to those with similar destiny than those with similar past. What mattered to Peter was Jesus, who is now taken over his life. The other apostles, who are his teammates, they mattered more than the connection in history. Where the people we are going, the people who, who share destiny with us are more important than the ones who share our, the past with us. And that will give us a lot of effectiveness as we seek to help people to realize their full potential and to go to where we feel God has called them to be, from where they are now 
to a better place. That's what leadership is all about. Thank you very much.